Lindsay Autry from the regional and Sarah Sai. Thanks for coming and enjoy your evening tonight. So as Diane mentioned, um, I'm Lindsay Autry. I'm the executive chef and partner at the regional. Hi, in the back. Um, unfortunately, the regional is still closed because of COVID, but we're hopeful to open in the next few months when we get a little bit closer to the next season when it starts again. Um, but uh, as Diane mentioned, uh, Sarah Seip is with me. Um, Sarah is our uh, pastry chef. And Sarah and I have worked together, I don't know, I feel like I say the same number like 11 or 12 years. Yeah, I've long, known her longer than my husband. Um, so uh, yeah, so I've known Sarah a long time. And this is Vicki Barrett, who is our sous chef extraordinaire that um, agrees when I call her at the last minute and say, please come help us cook. Um, so uh, this is the team. And um, I'm really excited to be here. This is the first event that I've done since the last one we did. Um, so it's good to be out and cooking and, and doing this again. So um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm originally from North Carolina. The longer I talk, the longer my vowels get. So I do my best to clear my throat. Um, with the mask, you won't be able to maybe see it, but you'll hear it. Um, so for me, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I grew up on a peach orchard in eastern North Carolina, and so farming has always been a part of my life. So when I got the opportunity to meet Diane and Carl, um, it just brings back so many memories, and that's how I really got into cooking, was being surrounded by food and living in a rural area where there was really nothing else to do. Um, and so I really fell in love with it, and luckily, my whole family was like, you're gonna go do what? And I was like, I'm gonna go cook. And they're like, like the place down the street that makes barbecue and fried fish for $5? And I was like, no, it's gonna be better, I promise. Um, <laughs> It took 20 years, but it did get better. Um, so anyways, I've lived in Palm Beach now for, I guess, 12 years when uh, Sarah and I first met when we moved here to open what was the Omfoy on Palm Beach um, many, many moons ago. And, um, and now we have the regional hopefully reopening uh, very soon. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the first dish that I'm gonna show you guys tonight is called uh, pickled shrimp. And um, pickled shrimp is a very like coastal, low country, Carolinas um, dish. Um, it's kind of misleading because it's called pickled, but don't worry, we're not gonna like put pickled juice in it. Um, it's more of a heavy brine. It has a lot of acid from lemon. Um, and you do, uh, the longer you marinate it, the better it gets. Um, and it gets really briny, almost, I like to tell people it's like the southerner's version of ceviche. Um, so, to go ahead and get started, um, we have uh, about eight cups of water, more or less, uh, boiling. And we're just going to flavor this water, season the water, um, to cook our shrimp. And so I'm using some, I've got one pound of what's called 2125. So this is like a medium-sized shrimp. Uh, for those of you that don't know, sometimes it's confusing at the store, but all the different numbers just mean an approximate amount per pound. So roughly there's 20 one to 25 pieces in a pound, uh, which helps you kind of figure out how many you need depending on how many you're serving. Um, so we've got one pound of shrimp and um, we've got some Old Bay. Um, at the restaurant we used to make our own Old Bay and then I realized in my old age that if somebody makes it better than you, then just buy it, right? <laughs> some things I make really well homemade. Old Bay is one of those things that it's much better to spend the $4 and buy the can. So um, we're using about three tablespoons. We're gonna save one tablespoon to put in our brine and we're gonna use the other two um, to season our water. And because we're gonna add so much other flavor, we're not gonna really worry about adding any other flavor to the water, just some Old Bay so that it imparts a little bit. So we're gonna bring that, that um, back to a boil. And in the meantime, we're gonna start on our brine. So I've, um, we're gonna start with the zest and juice of three lemons. And so I've already done a couple. And uh, we're gonna use a microplane to take the zest off. Um, I've zested a lot of lemons, so I go pretty fast. Um, but I think a lot of times when people have a microplane or if you're removing the zest, sometimes you think it's supposed to be like cheese and go back and forth, right? Well, you don't wanna do that because if you rasp the lemon too far, you get into the pith, right? And that's very bitter. So you wanna just move it one time just to get the essential oils and that first layer of that oily skin off and kind of turn it as you go. Um, some people 
well, do it the other way and let the microplane do the work and go around. It's just kind of what uh, you feel more comfortable with. Um, for me, I can go faster just kind of rolling it. So we use the, the zest and then um, the juice. So we're just going to cut this in half. And then to this, we're going to add um, a few different um, spices. So we're going to add that remaining tablespoon of Old Bay. And then we've also got some celery seed. You know you've all got celery seed in your cupboard from making Bloody Marys, and you don't know what else to do with it. So this is what you do with it. You make pickle shrimp. So we're going to add about a teaspoon of celery seed. Celery seed's pretty strong. Uh, the remaining uh, tablespoon of Old Bay. I'm going to add a little bit of crushed red pepper for heat. Um, you can omit that if you don't want it too spicy. Old Bay has a little bit of heat in it. And then we're going to add about seven or eight dried um, bay leaves. If you're using fresh, which are beautiful, they're a little hard to find down here. Um, but if you do find some, you can use a little bit more. They're not quite as potent as the dried ones. So we're going to add the bay leaves in there. And I'm just going to give this a quick stir. And you want to go kind of in this order. You want to get all your spices into the lemon juice before you add your oil, because that's going to help like kind of bloom it and actually like infuse um, the flavor of those spice as well. You can do it after you add the oil, but what happens is the spices will kind of suspend themselves in the oil and won't make it all the way through. Um, so it's a lot better to do it that way first. And so then um, I've got like two cloves of garlic that I just chopped up. We're going to add those in. And then we're going to use half of a sweet onion. So we're going to cut this in half. And we're going to slice this as thin as we can. And usually um, what happens is after a day, if you slice them really thin, the onions really do melt into the marinade. It doesn't taste like raw onion in there. Um, because you've given it a good amount of time. So we're going to slice that really thin. And then Diane also has some really great uh, spring onions that she gave me, or some scallions. And so I'm going to use some of those in there as well. Um, you could use one or the other, kind of depending on, on what you have. But the onion flavor does really help mellow out the acidity from the lemons. So we're going to add the onions in there. And then I'm going to use a couple of these green onions. And we're just going to slice these really thin. And what's great about this dish is that this is something you can make up to about three, three days ahead. I really don't like to serve seafood after three days. But the longer it sits, it's really good on like day two and three. I mean, it's good after a full day in the refrigerator, but it really, it's really good like day two and three. So the ones you're going to have today are on day three, so I hope you like them. Um, so we've got the scallions in there now, and like I said, that's not in your recipe, but Diane has such beautiful ones now that I wanted to go ahead and add those in. Um, and then we're going to add a little bit of fresh herbs. So I've got some fresh dill, and you could chop it if you want, but dill is such a delicate herb that the more you chop it, it, it tends to turn black like basil does. Um, it oxidizes very quickly. So I just like to kind of rip it and tear um, little pieces of the dill sprigs in. And I'm going to go ahead now that uh, we've let the Old Bay kind of sit in the liquid, I'm going to go ahead and add in our shrimp. Now, because these are like medium sized, they're only going to take about a minute and a half to cook. You just want them to barely turn opaque. And the best way to to cook shrimp, um, especially if you're doing like a, bol a boiling technique for like shrimp cocktail or something like this that you're going to um, pre-cook them. A lot of people tell you, or recipes will tell you to shock them in water, right? But the problem with that is you've just spent this time like seasoning your water 
to try and give the shrimp a little bit of flavor. And then you wash it all away when you put it in ice water. And you also wash away the flavor of the shrimp. So you want to let them just barely turn pink and then take them out. And then the proper uh, technique is called carryover cooking. It's not that complicated, right? It's hot. It keeps cooking. It carries over while it cooks. So you want to pull them out just before they're done. And then as they cool, they'll, they'll finish cooking through. So these are actually already done. And so we're just going to pull them out and just let them cool slightly while we finish the last part of the marinade. And you can see how quickly those cooked. And you didn't need to boil them for too long. So now we're just going to um, chop up a little bit of parsley. And even though chopping herbs is chopping herbs, I always like to talk about, you may have heard before when people talk about a chiffonade, um, and usually that refers to like basil. A lot of people talk about chiffonading basil, which means a ribbon cut. Um, I tell my cooks all the time, whenever I tell them to chop parsley, they'll take a whole lot of it, and they just take their knife and they just like go back and forth at it, right? And it takes them like an hour, and then it's black, and then it just doesn't, even though it seems like it might take longer, it's actually faster to work in smaller batches. And then you just kind of like bunch everything together, roll it together. It doesn't need to be perfect. You don't need to lay every leaf. Just as long as you have a good grip on all, as much parsley as you can handle. And then using your whole knife, you make a rocking motion and slice as thin as you can. through and just as the leaves kind of fall you just want to like pinch them all back together so you can keep them all in your hand and so now everything is kind of like for the most part uniform and so we're just going to kind of mix it around and then kind of grip it the same way and do the same thing and even though it may seem like it's a little tedious, it's a lot, it's actually a lot faster than doing this, right? And you also, doing that, you dull your knife. Um, so just making those few run-throughs like that, it'll keep your parsley dry, it won't clump up on you, and it's actually a lot faster than you doing the crazy back and forth. So we've got parsley, we've got our lemon juice, all of our spices, um, and now we're going to add in our olive oil. So we're going to add in um, about one cup, which seems like a lot, but we're putting a lot of shrimp in there, and it's a brine. We're not going to drink this later. We're going to take the shrimp out and eat it, um, but the, uh, that olive oil is going to balance out so now we're going to take our shrimp and you don't have to wait for them to cool completely i mean they're still warm but they're not hot so we're going to go ahead and slide those in and then we're going to just mix this together and um, what's really great, and you'll see this a lot, and I think just in the South, they just use mason jars for everything. Um, but you can put them in a jar. You want to put them in a container that's going to, you don't want to put it in a giant bowl where they're just kind of like swimming around and they don't, you want to make sure that you put them in something small enough that the liquid is able to cover them completely. Um, so that could be, a Tupperware, it could be like a Pyrex, anything that you can really like crowd it in. Um, and I've had a couple people ask me because it's called pickled and because I put it in a jar, that does not mean that it can sit in your pantry. It's seafood, it has to be refrigerated, okay? Please don't do that. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna put those in here. 
And then, um, like I said, I mean, this, is, this would be good in 12 hours, but it would be even better after about 48 to 72. And so, I'm just gonna get all this in here. So these two, and I brought, um, I ended up putting my garlic in it, but I also brought like some little jars. So if you wanted to make this for a group or for a dinner party, or you're having some people over in a few days, you can make little individual ones too. Um, these are great just served with like crackers, but tonight we're gonna make a little salad with it um, with some avocado, radish, and grapefruit. And so I'll show you guys how we're gonna plate that. And that's my one-year-old running around, I apologize. <laughs> COVID babysitting, come to the cooking class. <laughs> Learn something. <laughs> Wash some dishes. Yeah, so I probably could have used a little smaller of a mason jar. That was the only size I could find. But if you pack it all in and you see that at least all the oil is like covering them, right? Um, and then definitely, like I said, put it in the fridge. Do not put it in the pantry. Um, and so now um, I'm just going to show you a little salad that we're going to do with it. So um, Diane had given me a bunch of uh, carrots, and even though it's not in the recipe, I wanted to show you guys a, a technique um, for, for peeling carrots or to do um, carrots for a salad. I think a lot of times, you know, even myself, um, cutting vegetables gets tedious when you're making something like a salad and then you're making something else for dinner. You feel like you're chopping for like hours. Um, so one thing that um, I like to do is we make little ribbons and I do this with um, radishes, celery, anything that's kind of long. And if you just use your vegetable peeler um, and start peeling down, take the first few layers off. Um, and you can make these pretty ribbons uh, to put in your salad or into a pasta or really any type of saute. And you don't have to use your knife for one more thing. You just continue to, to use your peeler and then you get these pretty little ribbons. Um, so we're gonna put those in a bowl and then we're also uh, using a few different types of radish. Um, uh, Diane and Carl have these beautiful watermelon radishes right now and so we just shave these really thin and then cut them into uh, matchsticks. So we're gonna put those in. And what's great about radishes, and especially all these root vegetables, is you can cut them like this and put them in a little water in a container and they'll last for like five days and then just kind of use them throughout the week. Um, and then we've got some of um, these like larger uh, French style radishes. And I am gonna use a mandolin for these. Um, if you use a mandolin, I suggest you always wear a glove or use the guard. I use these a lot, so I don't like the guard, but I do always wear a glove, see? And then that way, if you cut anything, you cut the glove before you cut your finger. Um, so we're gonna add a little bit of that in there as well. And then uh, I also got some, I say sorrel, um, some people call it I have to clear my throat, sorrel. Um, if I say sorrel, how my mouth wants to say it, I sound like sorrel and then nobody knows what I'm saying. So I call it sorrel. Um, so sorrel is a very like lemony type of green. Um, it's very delicate, um, but it is pretty powerful. So I like to chop it up and um, we're just gonna make thin little ribbons with this. And the citrusness of the, of the sorrel with the pickled shrimp really matches well. And I hope that you enjoy it when you guys get to taste it. So we're gonna add the sorrel in there. And then the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add a grapefruit. So um, I wanted to show you all how to segment. Um, I think it's one of those things that sometimes 
it's a little intimidating um, how to pull the segments out. So uh, you can do this with any type of citrus, oranges, lemons, limes, grapefruit. Um, but typically it's done with not lemons and limes, they're a little bit more sour. So you, cut, you wanna cut the top off just until you expose uh, the full flesh. And then you wanna do the same thing on the bottom. And then we're gonna lay it flat. And it's best to do this with a little serrated knife or a bread knife. Um, it tends to work better than a straight blade, uh, like a chef knife. And then you wanna follow the direction of the grapefruit or the orange and just gently kind of follow it. And you wanna cut away all of that pith and peel. And I just got this knife, but these little plastic handled, uh, this one is Wustoff. There's also Victoria Knox. I've seen them at Publix, like on the random aisle where they try and sell uh, kitchen stuff. These are great. <clears throat> they're great for citrus. They're great for tomatoes. I use this knife more than all my very expensive Japanese ones. Um, and these things are like $5. So if you ever see them, they're the best. I'll start using it now because now I feel guilty. Um, but so we're just gonna go and then we're gonna turn it around and we just wanna make sure that we get all of that pith off. I just remember my mom always ate grapefruit for breakfast with the grapefruit knife, fork, spoon thing. And um, I just always thought it was so gross because you eat the pith and it's so bitter. Um, but once you, I, I love grapefruit as long as I can get all this stuff off of it. Um, so I like to eat it this way. So now that we've gotten all the pith off and it's really clean, we're gonna do this, let me grab a bowl. So now you can see where all the segments are. And so you're gonna take your knife and run it right along each side of where that is. And then you'll see the clean segment will just fall right out. So we're just gonna continue to do that all the way around. And some are small and some are bigger. Um, but if you ever wanted to, you know, make a really pretty salad and take your time to make segments or to put it on a dessert, um, this is just kind of a nice technique. And I'll stop there just to show you another way too. If you just wanted to clean that part, um, you can also go through and then slice um, this way if you wanted to do some type of salad that featured you know, citrus, and then you can kind of lay it out that way. Um, and what's great too is that when you go in to cut those segments, your knife is naturally gonna hit any seeds if there are any. Um, and so it's, it's a good technique and usually don't get any of the seeds in it either. So then we've got the grapefruit. And so for the salad, when you go to serve your, your shrimp, the liquid is actually gonna increase um, just because the water from the onions and um, the oil reacting with the shrimp, everything just kind of becomes a little bit juicier. And so <clears throat> when you serve it, you're gonna have all this left. So I actually like to use the brine as our dressing. You don't have to make another dressing. It's already done for you, right? You did all that work. You might as well use it. Um, so now we're going to add the, uh, the grapefruit segments in. And then lastly, we're going to add a little bit of avocado because everything we have here is, is pretty bright and acidic. Um, so we want something that's got a little bit of fat, a little bit of oil to it. So I'm just gonna use about a quarter of the avocado. And see, even for a chef, an avocado is a crapshoot. You never know. It's, it's really frustrating to spend like $2 on something and then you get home and you're like, oh my God. But it happens to me too, you're not alone. Um, so we're just gonna cut kind of large pieces. And then I'm just gonna grab one of these salad plates. 
And so if you wanted to make more of a composed dish like this, um, you could be fancy and plate it individual like we're going to do. Um, or you could do it kind of family style and lay the salad. And what's great is that the salad is mostly vegetables and citrus. And the little bit of um, sorrel acts more as an herb than an actual green. So it won't wilt on you quickly. Um, it'll stay kind of nice and bright. So you could put it out kind of family style. And then I'm actually going to grab some of the shrimp that I'm serving you guys. Can you pull that out? Um, and so these, and then you can kind of see that, you know, the coloration has changed a little bit from the Old Bay and all the herbs. Um, it's made it a little bit more red just from all the time and the brine. And that is your pickled shrimp. But if you use canned, um, you want them to absorb the flavor. So it's okay that you put everything at the same time. The only thing we're not gonna put in right away is our meat and our green beans. Um, so I'm gonna start first with our potatoes. And every time I take my mask off, I mess up my microphone and I don't wanna make Carl come over here and do this again. So I'm not gonna taste this right now, but normally you would taste it, see kind of where your flavor is. And so we're gonna go ahead and add our potatoes and we're gonna add our turnips. And so, like I said, you can use all kinds of vegetables. You could use carrots, you could use sweet potato if you want. It's really a great way to like get rid of leftover. You know, you've got like one sweet potato, you got two carrots, it's a great dish. And Brunswick stew is one of those things that's kind of like chili, like it's always better the next day. Um, so if you make a big batch of this and either freeze it or try and convince your kids that they can eat the same thing for a couple of days in a row. Um, it's always better if you can make a big batch of it. And it's definitely kind of one of those quarantine things that takes a little bit, but it's worth it in the end. Um, so normally what I would do, but I don't wanna keep you guys here all night, is I would let this come up to a simmer, right? Because if you dump everything in at one time, it's gonna cool off your whole pot and it's gonna take a long time to come back up. So it's better to just do it in small increments um, and then that way it'll cook faster. So I would put the potatoes and the turnips in, let it come up to a good simmer. Then I would add in um, the lima beans, we're gonna add in fresh corn. And for the vegetables, I mean, it's really up to you. I like to use equal amounts of everything so that when I'm eating it, it's all about the same. It's not too heavy on one thing. And then um, we've got all these different uh, beans. So we've got green beans, we've got some yellow uh, wax beans, and then there's also some pole beans that are in there. And uh, we're gonna add these um, towards the end because green beans cook Rare, uh, fairly quickly, and you really want to be able to simmer this for at least 30 to 45 minutes because you want the potatoes and the turnips to get really tender, and you want all the flavor of all those things we put in there, barbecue sauce and brown sugar and Worcestershire and garlic and tomatoes and all of that to really come together and make you know, one flavorful soup. So you wanna cook this for a while. So I would say that you didn't really, you don't wanna add your green beans until like the last 10 minutes um, because you want them to have a little bit of a bite. Or if you grew up like me, your grandmother cooked green beans as long as she cooked everything else and it was kinda like mush. Um, but I do like a little bit of texture in there. So we're gonna pretend that that's been 45 minutes, the magic of television and let that simmer. And then lastly, um, I've got some uh, pulled chicken and um, I've also got some smoked pork shoulder. Now, I'm a chef, so I have things like smoked pork shoulder sitting around, okay? But I do encourage you that if you ever decide, hey, I'm gonna go smoke this pork butt or I'm gonna you know, roast a whole chicken, I always like to do a little bit extra. If I'm gonna take the time to do it, I typically will do a couple pounds more than what I really need 
because I can freeze it and then find a use for it later and it'll make a meal that normally would take a really long time to try and do all from scratch, but I've got little pieces like this in my freezer. So um, I did smoke a pork butt for y'all though, okay? <laughs> but, um, but I did make an extra pound and put it in the freezer so next time I gotta do something, I've got it. So um, I've just smoked it with hickory Kind of a long process, but I did smoke it for you guys. I will not haunt your dreams if you go to a barbecue place and buy a pound of pork and then throw it in here, okay? And then you can do that. Same thing with chicken. You go to Costco, get you a rotisserie chicken, shred it up, throw it in there too. I won't say anything. I may or may have done that before. So, um, so you just want to simmer it all, but also um, it's a little... To me, Brunswick stew should be a little brothy. It's not gonna have like a lot of, um, of body. It's not gonna be super thick. But the starch from the potatoes is gonna give it a little bit of thickness. Um, I don't like it when it's so heavy that it just becomes this like mass. Uh, I, don't, I don't like that. So I think it's always good for you. And this recipe yields a good mix of that. If you find that you want more stuff in it, you can always pull a little bit of the broth out, strain a little bit out, or if you have more things, you can put more things in. Um, but that is the base for Brunswick stew. Um, it's a delicious meal on its own. It's good with crackers, cornbread, and for some reason they serve it as a side dish at barbecue restaurants, but I like it by itself. So we're gonna um, plate up some Brunswick stew for you guys now. I wanted to make a panzanella salad, but I wanted to do one that wouldn't require so many steps. I love a panzanella salad, but it usually takes like roasting a chicken, then cooling it, then pulling it, then doing this. So um, I don't have TikTok, but I see a lot of people talking about all these like one, I keep seeing this cheese and tomato thing that everybody keeps making. Um, but I think uh, something that was, became trendy a couple of years ago was um, like sheet pan meals, like making everything on a sheet pan. So um, that's what this technique is. And so we're gonna make a panzanella salad all on one pan. Um, and trust me, it does work. I tested it a couple times. Um, so we're using uh, just a rustic loaf of sourdough. Um, any type of crusty bread would work for this. Ciabatta, baguette, um, any type of like multigrain, anything that's got a crust to it. I would not use Wonder Bread or sliced <laughs> sandwich bread. I mean, you can, it's just gonna turn into mush. So something that's got a little bit of structure to it. Um, and so this is a really big one. So the recipe calls for a half a loaf. And that would be like normally a half of like what's considered a three pound loaf. This is more like a five. So um, we're going to just roughly cut this and, and we're gonna make croutons with this. So if you've ever used or bought like a really beautiful like loaf of art artisanal bread, it's really only good that day. You know, it gets kind of, especially um, in South Florida with the humidity and everything, it tends to get really chewy um, the next day. And really the best way to save any fresh bread is to wrap it up and freeze it. Even if you're gonna just eat it the next day, um, freezing it really will save it. Um, so, and, and bread that's a little bit stale works great for this salad. Um, I know that uh, Diane sells a lot with uh, Breads by Johnny and I think he has great stuff. Um, and, but I'm really good friends with uh, Michael Hackman who has aioli. If any of you are familiar uh, with aioli, it's uh, further down in, in West Palm. Um, but he baked these for me uh, this morning. And uh, that's why it's still a little soft, but we're just gonna chop this up into um, just some kind of bite-sized crouton pieces. And we're gonna use four uh, chicken thighs. The recipe says about three pounds, um, which would be anywhere between four and six, depending on how big they are. Um, but this recipe is good for, for about four. 
And so I'm just going to cut just a little bit more of this bread. Um, so we're going we're gonna to take this and we're going to put it in a bowl and we're going to add in some cherry tomatoes at the same time. Let me just grab another glove. So um, we've got um, some cherry tomatoes from here on the farm and they're all different sizes. So if you are using some small ones, then it's great to just leave these whole. Because with a panzanella salad, um, you want to make a crusty bread, but then you want to kind of get it a little bit moist again so that it's easy to eat and it becomes part of the dressing. So we're going to go ahead and um, season this with a little bit of salt and pepper. I'm going to drizzle a little bit of olive oil in, just about a tablespoon or so. And then um, I like to use a little bit of finely grated Parmesan cheese. You can use any type of dry cheese, Asiago, um, Pecorino. And we're going to really just kind of massage the bread because we want the cheese to stick to it. We want the oil to really coat all those little cubes of bread. And now we're going to add tomatoes directly to this. So like I said, we've got um, a few different sizes. If they were all really small, um, then I would just leave them whole. But some of these big ones, we're just going to cut those in half. Because we want everything to cook evenly. But see, then I have some small ones. So I'm going to throw the small ones in whole. And those will burst. And then the bigger ones, we're just going to cut them right in half. Now, um, we're also going to add a couple of cloves of garlic to this. And we're going to do that same technique that we did the last time. We made the Brunswick stew and just uh, grate it on the microplane. Or you could use a garlic press if you want. It's better to get it to a fine uh, texture than to try and chop it. Um, because then you won't get it consistent enough that it'll, um, some pieces will burn. So we really want the garlic just to kind of melt in. If you wanted to omit it, uh, you could. Um, I just think it's kind of nice. It adds a little bit of an extra layer of flavor. So I'm going to grab one more clove of garlic. I'm just going to grate that right into it. I'm going to do one more. And I'm just going to add a little bit more salt and a little bit more pepper and a little bit more olive oil now just to coat those tomatoes because the bread pretty much absorbed all the oil that we put in there the first time. So now we're just going to spread all this out on our sheet pan and there's you don't need to have anything perfect about it but do take the second that any of the tomatoes that you have cut in half it's best to turn them up so that the juices uh, concentrate down into the skin and it doesn't run all over the sheet pan so that's the only kind of a extra little step that you should take so we're just going to put that down and then Next, um, I've got some chicken thighs, and so we are using them with the skin because the, as the fat of the skin renders down, uh, that's also going to create kind of the sauce um, and the vinaigrette. So we're just going to season this well um, with salt and pepper. Now, at this point, this is when, if you wanted to add a different flavor, you could add like a spice blend. Um, if you wanted it a bit more Mediterranean, you know, you could add like oregano or lemon zest. Um, if you wanted it a bit more kind of Italian in style, you could uh, do oregano as well or basil, um, you know, and use some spice blends that you may have or just uh, give it flavor. But I'm just going to leave it kind of simple. Uh, the ones that I made for you guys, I did put um, some lemon zest and olive oil. And um, I'm getting ahead of myself. And so then we've got a, a few sprigs of thyme. Um, it helps give a nice little extra flavor. Um, but you could easily omit this if you wanted to. Um, but I find that 
the thyme gives a nice flavor. So we're just going to kind of make four little bunches of thyme, and we're going to put the chicken right on top. And so now we're going to um, go and pretend to put this in the oven, okay? And so the recipe will tell you that you want to use the upper and, and lower um, thirds of your oven, right? Like leave the, the middle part. And you want to put this in the bottom. And you want to roast it for about 25 minutes. And halfway through, once your skin is getting kind of crispy, you want to turn it over, right? And let the, un the underside get a little bit of color. And then you're going to take it out. And, uh, and you'll take the chicken off. And then let me just change my gloves real quick. And so next, we're going to add um, our green element to it. Um, we're going to use some escarole, but you could easily use kale. Um, Diane had given me what she calls uh, spigarella greens, which are like a broccoli green. Those are one of my favorites from here. Um, so I mix those in too. Um, but you could really use any type of um, green that you like, but you want something hearty, something that's going to cook well. Um, I love kale, but I get tired of kale, to be honest with you. Um, Everybody talks about it all the time. So I like to mix it into things. Um, the other thing with kale is kale needs to be massaged. My hands are sweating, so now I can't get this glove on. So we're just going to make it look weird and just keep it like that. Um, the thing is with kale, and I'm going to do the same thing with escarole, but escarole is a little bit lighter. You need to really massage kale and put some kind of acid in there, a lemon, a little bit of vinegar, what have you. So we have some escarole, and we've washed it, dried it, and we're just going to roughly um, break this. So we're just going to break up that escarole, and we're going to add a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, and we're going to add the juice of about a half of a lemon. And... A little bit of olive oil. And then we're just going to massage this really good. And like I was saying, if you're using kale or those spigarella greens that are a little bit tougher, you just want to like really massage it for a while until you feel it getting softer. And I promise you it'll have a much better texture than like the tree bark that you may have experienced if you tried to cook it and you didn't do this to it. But you need to put some kind of acid and some kind of oil and really massage it. So then after your chicken's cooked um, for about 25 minutes, you want to pick the chicken up. So we're going to pretend that this is cooked, right? We're going to pretend it's cooked. You want to take the chicken off, and you're going to put the, the escarole down now and just kind of like sprinkle it everywhere. You're going to get rid of the thyme because you don't want to eat that. I mean, it's good, but you'll chew on it for a while. So you're going to get rid of that. And you're going to replace it with the escarole. Put your chicken back in. Now you're going to put it under the broiler right, for just a few minutes. Depends on how hard your broiler is. Mine's pretty crazy and doesn't do anything for like two minutes and then I walk away and then everything burns. So, but you wanna do broil because you wanna get a really high heat just to char those greens and to crisp up that skin, right? And so we're gonna pretend that we just did that. And then this is what it looks like, right? So it's gotten really nice and crispy. Your greens have kind of melted down. Your tomatoes have wilted down. And then um, when you go to serve this, um, just let me grab one more plate. You're just gonna move your chicken off to the side. kind of build up your bread and your charred greens and all your roasted tomatoes. And I really like goat cheese um, on this salad. I think that it blends nicely. If you don't like goat cheese, you could use a little bit more of that Parmesan cheese. You don't have to do cheese. It just helps add a little bit of creaminess. Um, and so I'm just going to crumble a little bit of that right on top. And then we just serve the chicken uh, right alongside. And that's your roasted chicken 
panzanella salad. Right? Sarah is the pastry chef, so I'm gonna let her demo, but I'm gonna tell you a funny story real quick since my husband had to leave with the baby, and this is what I get. So um, the pie that we're gonna make, I usually use the food processor, and I told my husband, hey, can you make sure you clean that up real good for me? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, put it in the car, and he did, and he took the blade out. So I'm gonna do it with my hands, all right? Okay. So, no, it's fine. You can do it either way. And Sarah's going to demo, and I'm going to be her Vanna White, so I can do this while I talk. Um, so this dish, and if you guys don't mind, I'm very far away from y'all, and I am vaccinated, so I'm going to just take this down for a minute. Okay. I feel I've never felt, like, lip, cheek sweat like I am right now, so very attractive. Um, all right, so this dish that we're going to make, it's called Atlantic Beach Pie. And um, like I said, Sarah's been my pastry chef for 12 years, so I'm a little spoiled. And then I don't ever really have to make dessert because I just tell Sarah, okay, this is what we're going to do. And she always has the most amazing ideas. But um, during the pandemic and the restaurant being closed and me still doing some events and things, I've had to start doing my own desserts. And um, I wasn't sure if Sarah was going to be able to make it. And so this is a dessert that I love to make. And, um, and so I did this and then I told Sarah and Sarah's like, what are you doing? But I promise you it's delicious. Um, so just keeping with kind of still that, that Southern uh, theme, um, in North Carolina, especially like in the 80s, and North Carolina and South Carolina, there's a lot of um, fried seafood restaurants. That's pretty much how they do all seafood, is just fry it. Um, and so you go to these seafood restaurants, and as a kid, we would go to the beach, and you'd go to these places, and the only thing they had on the dessert menu was what they called Atlantic Beach pie. And it's a lemon pie. And essentially, it's just like a key lime pie. It's the exact same technique of making like a crumb crust. Um, and then it has um, a really simple filling that's based with condensed milk, eggs, and lemon juice instead of key lime juice. Um, but the crust is made with saltine crackers. And I know you're probably like, that's weird. But when you taste it, it's really delicious because it's salty um, and it's a reason to use saltines other than like, this is showing my age, when I got that and a seven up when I complained about being sick. I think that's about the only time we ever ate saltines. Um, I really still like them crumbled in the soup. So, um, but you can do it by hand, like I'm doing. Thanks, David, wherever you are. Um, or you can do it in a food processor. So it's, it's really up to you. Um, a food processor is a lot quicker. Um, but you can get some frustration out and crumble them. And because saltines are so brittle and dry, it's really not that hard to do. Um, so for, um, for this, I'll let Sarah talk about it. But um, the, the crust, just so you know, the recipe, it makes a lot because typically this is like a pretty deep dish crust. So depending on how deep you, you're making it, um, and we're actually using a tart mold, so it's a little bit thinner. Um, if you were using a, a more shallow um, pie dish, by all means, you could cut this recipe for the crust in half. Um, but if you're using a really deep one, then make the full recipe. But you may have a little bit left over, but I wrote the recipe that way because it makes the best ratio. Um, and really, um, you'll, you'll see that you develop a feel for it. Um, and because saltines are a lot more brittle than like graham crackers, this takes a little bit more butter than a graham cracker crust because it needs it to bind it. Take it away, Sarah. I'm just gonna keep crushing saltines. All right, so she's mixing the crust. Um, so then once you get it really crumbly um, and fine, you're gonna add in your butter and you want it to be softened, not melted. Um, so if it's melted, it's just gonna soak all into those crackers and you kinda don't want that. You want that to happen when you bake it in the oven. Um, it also makes it easier to press into the tart shell um, when you use the softened butter. 
So I'm going to give it to Lindsay yeah. since she's mixing there. Just going to throw that so, right in there. Yes, yeah, so we've added um, a couple tablespoons of sugar just to balance the saltiness of the saltines. But we don't, we don't want to add a lot of sugar because the filling is really rich and sweet and we want that crust to be a little bit salty to balance. Okay, so, so while she's mixing that, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys how to make the filling. Um, it's super easy. It's essentially kind of a key lime pie. Maybe she mentioned that and I might have missed it. Um, but you're going to get four egg yolks separated. Um, so in case you guys missed it, I'll do another one for you. Um, so it's really easy. Just going to crack it. Do you want to press can, it in? Yeah. Okay. And then you're just going to kind of separate that egg white out of there. Um, we're actually going to use whipped cream for this one for garnish tonight, but you can certainly save your egg whites and make a meringue with it, um, which is really good also. And you would do like probably um, two to one ratio, so one part egg whites, two parts sugar, and uh, put it in the mixer and whip it up. Um, and then you could pipe it on and then put it in your broiler and get a nice toasted meringue if you'd like to do that. So since she finished the crust, I'm actually going to show you that first. Skip the egg gloves on that. And then, so this one, I think she had mentioned, but once you press it into the crust, you're going to bake it without the filling because it does take about 15 minutes at, uh, I'd say about 350. You want it to get a nice golden color. So you're just going to take that crust and kind of sprinkle it down in the bottom. You want to just push it in there really good. You want to press it down so it gets nice and firm. And usually what I'll do is kind of do the bottom first and then go up the sides. So I think since we had a little bit of a technical difficulty, we didn't get quite as much crumb in there and it's not spreading quite as far. Um, but you're going to, what I like to do is take a little bit and kind of go around the edges like this. And you really want to use your fingers and like just press it in there and get it really nice and and packed. Actually, it might be quite enough. <laughs> you know what you're doing. You definitely know what you're doing. So just maybe a little shy. But so we didn't bring one pre-baked, um, but you'll see once, once she plates them um, that they are nice and golden. Okay, so we're gonna pretend that we're baking this in the oven and it's gonna get nice and golden. Okay, and then, so what we're gonna do is take your egg yolks that we've done. There's supposed to be four, so I'm gonna put those guys in there. And then it's one can of condensed milk. So maybe you have some laying around or not, you can just pour that right in there. This is the easiest pie to throw together. It's so simple. And um, we've used fresh lemons. Um, you can certainly use lemon juice. It's not quite the same, um, but you can buy pre-made lemon juice if you're not feeling like juicing, but the, the fresh lemons really make a big difference. So you're just gonna mix that together. Get those yolks in there nice and uh, nice and integrated. And then last you're going to add your lemon juice. So pour that right in. And you really want to mix it right away and not let it sit there because what will tend to happen is that acid is going to cook your egg yolks if you don't mix it right away. So that's why you mix the yolks in with the sugar first before you add the juice. And you'll see once you mix it, it it's going to look liquid, and then as it sits, it'll actually thicken up a little bit. And it's funny because it's such a pale white, but once you bake it, it gets this really bright, nice yellow, lemony color that you're looking for. Um, and so this actually, if you wanted to change it, you could use key lime juice or you could use orange juice and it would work great too. Or you could use half orange, half lemon if you didn't want it quite as tart or quite as sweet. Um, Lindsay and I use a lot of citrus. Um, I'm a Florida girl. I grew up in Central Florida, so I'm, I'm, I love citrus. I use it in almost everything. It just adds such a brightness. 
So once you get that all mixed up, you're going to pour it into your crust, your cooked crust. And I think this recipe called for maybe, I'd say a nine inch or an eight inch pie. So this is just shy on this guy. You spread that around and then you're going to bake it. Um, and if you want, it's really nice to do it in a, um, a tart pan that's got a removable bottom. So once it's baked and cooled, you can lift it right out of there and slide it right off. Um, a lot of times I like to chill it for a little while after it's been baked. That'll really help it to slide right off of there and put it on a really nice pan. Um, and this is a great thing to serve. You can do fresh fruit or whipped cream, like I said. Um, we're using lemon and citrus tonight, and I'll show you guys what one looks like. When you, when you bake the crust, um, it bakes for, for about 12 to 14 minutes. Uh, just in turn, it turns golden. And then you want to take it out and let it cool. Um, but while the, the crust, you can let it cool, and you can go ahead and make the filling. You don't have to wait for the crust to totally cool because the condensed milk and the egg yolks, because we're not using egg whites, it's not gonna like react and make scrambled eggs. So you don't wanna do it when it's super hot, but as soon as you take your pie shell out of the oven, you can put it on a cooling rack or just kind of in a, in a cool space, and then make your filling, pour it in, put it right back in the oven. And then it sets pretty quickly. It's uh, about the same amount of time, about 14 minutes. So you can make this whole pie like start to finish in about 45 minutes if your husband doesn't forget to hide the blade to the food processor. Um, and then, I'm never gonna let him live it down, by the way. And um, so, and then it sets. Now, like Sarah was saying, this pie is best cold. So you want to refrigerate it for at least like five, six hours. Um, it's really great overnight because it has time to totally set and get really chilled. And then, like Sarah was saying, um, the classic way is we actually just make whipped cream, spread it all over the top, and then you can uh, zest like a little bit of lemon and limes, and it gives it a nice color. And then what really makes it is a little sprinkle of um, sea salt on top, which we'll do, um, and it really helps bring out um, and kind of cut the richness because you, you have some salt in the saltine, but it really helps. So we're gonna plate this up for you and tonight we're just serving it um, with some mixed berries and some cara cara oranges and um, a little bit of the sea salt. And a lot of whipped cream. We gotcha. I just finished whipping it. That I can do by hand. Crushed crackers, not so much. You got it, okay. All right, thank you. Does anybody have any questions about the pie? No? Okay.